Welcome to Film at 50, a podcast that celebrates semi-centennials in the world of cinema. I'm your host, Brian Rowe, and I'm thrilled to welcome Michael Branch to the podcast today to talk about Harold and Maude, starring Bud Court and Ruth Gordon, and directed by Hal Ashby, released 50 years ago in December of 1971. How are we doing, Michael? Hey, it's great to be with you. Good to see you again, Brian. Good to see you. Michael was one of my advisors on my MFA thesis committee at UNR from 2017 to 2018. And I know you've taught some classes on film history and I would love to kind of hear about how film, what role film has played in your life. And if you have a few favorites you can share with us, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, I appreciate it. I mean, I do teach a lot of film classes at the university, but I'm really not a film scholar. I sort of mm -hmm. came into it by realizing that so many of my students experience storytelling primarily through film mm -hmm. and that doesn't mean I don't want them to read also but I really found that I could work with students on film and help them sort of understand a lot of elements of narrative that that understanding then was really portable when they came back to studying literature so mm -hmm. I love film and I love teaching it I don't consider myself an expert but as an enthusiast it kind of gives me a point of connection with students and I teach a lot of different kinds of stuff I teach an auteur course on American directors I teach a history course and adaptation course. Um, and I started teaching genre film courses and I taught one recently on the Western, which is interesting because I think the Western is just full of all kinds of problems. And that's what made it so <laughs> fun and interesting to teach is this genre that was once super popular, but just encodes all kinds of problems from racial, gender, yeah. environmental points of view. And so that was really fun too. So I just consider myself a learner, not an expert. I kind of build these experiments around things I'm interested in, sort mm -hmm. of like your podcast, you set it up and you get to learn this stuff. So that's how I look at it too. Mm -hmm. Did Do you teach any films that were released in the 70s? I feel like the 70s, which is our decade we're really focusing on on the podcast, it's not a whole lot of great Westerns this decade. They're kind of dying out a little, would you say? Yeah, I, I would. By the <laughs> 70s, Westerns are kind of falling apart and then they're going to be brought back to life again, primarily in the same way blues music was, mm. Americans sort of gave up on it. And suddenly people from around the world were interested in this form. So, you know, there were Westerns being made in the seventies in Germany and Italy, of course, right. in South America and Asia. And so the form was kind of kept alive abroad and sort of re-imported. But I really do like uh, Westerns both for kind of the social problems that they unpack, the way we can sort of look at how our idea of identity and Americanness and landscape really did get encoded by this very American form in all kinds of problematic ways. But then also, you know, as with any genre uh, area in cinema, people need to reinvent it. They need to blow it up and mm -hmm. they need to parody it and they need to change it, make it more yeah. representative. So I really like when um, Western sort of came back after the heyday because they came back in ways that were a lot more creative. So that, that's been kind of fun too. And you see genre conventions from the western and lots of other kinds of movies too so i always have to kind of warn people at first like this is not like your granddaddy's western right it, <laughs> i just grew up with my both of my grandfathers just watched westerns all day and loved it mm -hmm. i'm really more interested in it for what kind of story it tells about us how did that genre become so super popular but you're right i mean to me the 70s is the greatest decade in american cinema i just think it's fantastic but it certainly is not a great time for westerns right it, yeah, so what do you love about films of the 70s? What were directors doing in this decade that you thought was really cool? Well, I mean, the main thing is, you know, at the end of the 60s, you have the studio system starting to collapse. Right. And it had such control, both horizontal and vertical integration. It really monopolized the whole industry to the point where, you know, unless the film was being made abroad, there was really no room for independent filmmaking. Mm -hmm. And so one of the reasons I, I just love Hal Ashby and all these other directors who were associated with New Hollywood in the 70s, you know, Altman, Coppola, Cassavetes, mm -hmm. Scorsese, De Palma, all of these people are basically bringing an, an indie cinema sensibility to Hollywood. So, so I value these people for helping to kill the studio system, basically, <laughs> um, which I think had become really moribund. But also, um, you know, it's in the late 60s that we see the collapse of the Hayes Code, which had been in place mm -hmm. since the mid 30s. And as you know, that was kind of a, an industry, a set of industry self-censorship guidelines right. that were designed to kind of keep federal regulation out of Hollywood. But 
you know, the Hayes Code was so limiting. I mean, sex, drugs, violence, uh, you know, you weren't even allowed to let a character who did a bad thing, like commit a crime, come to a good end. They had mm -hmm. to come to a bad end. And so there were so many limits on filmmakers. And, you know, the late 60s, when that breaks down and you start to get the work of a Robert Altman or a Francis Coppola or Al Ashby, I mean, I just think what film could be in the United States just exploded in right. ways that to me are really exciting. So that was kind of the countercultural decade in terms of social satire and social commentary, but also just like weird, funky, different kinds <laughs> of filmmaking that had not happened before. So I, I really value that period because it's such a period of experimentation. And to my mind, by the time you get to the 80s, things really start to get corporate and really firm up again. But there's this whole gap between the studio <laughs> system and the mega blockbuster, you know, kind of Jaws Star Wars era. And in that gap, you have these really creative directors doing some really, really weird, funky stuff. Yeah, I mean, until Jaws in the summer of 75, there's really no such thing as the blockbuster. I mean, The Godfather <laughs> next year, we'll talk about it for 72, that movie was a big hit, but it's it's not the kind of blockbuster we think of when we think of like Jaws and Star Wars. This was this period of like five, six, seven years where it was really just about the visions of these great directors. It's really makes this period of film history really interesting to study. Yeah, I really agree with you, Brian. And also, I mean, even The Godfather, which was the most profitable film ever at that time, mm -hmm. um, you know, you're talking about just a few years after the collapse of the Hayes Code in, you know, 67, 68. And what's interesting, we think about The Godfather, is if you go back to films of the 20s before the Hayes Code came in, mm -hmm. there were lots of gangster movies. It was a very popular genre. There were lots of gangster movies in which the gangster was an interesting, complex, humanized character. Mm -hmm. But then the Hayes Code basically said, no, you can't do that. We don't want viewers to make a mistake and think these criminals could actually be real decent people, right? <laughs> <laughs> so they became two-dimensional for this whole period. Yeah. So, you know, it isn't that Coppola's film isn't genius, but I also like to look at it in the context of that history because, you know, it's the fir really the first major gangster film after the fall of the Hayes Code, which mm. is to say mm -hmm. it's the first opportunity for a director to humanize gangsters, which is what Coppola does so well, makes us care about these people and see them as, you know, people who have families and who have tragedy and pain and ambition and, so that three-dimensional character, you know, is made possible fundamentally by this elimination of censorship. So, um, yeah, the 70s are just, it's kind of a free-for-all. Like I say, it's <laughs> between the monolith of the studio system and the monolith of corporate blockbusters, there's just this weird little gap where these guys are just doing really weird stuff. Yeah. And has film always played an important role in your life as you grew up? Like when you were younger, like, did you see a lot of movies? Do you have any favorites like to this day that you can watch over and over? Do you have any favorites? Yeah, I do. I do did grow up watching a lot of movies and, um, you know, I never had any kind of academic interest in mm. film, but, you know, I always was, was interested in film and it's fun now to be able to screen some of the films that I loved as a kid with my kids and see that wheel come all the way right. around. <laughs> and in fact, you know, to, to, to jump in a little bit um, on Harold and Maude, mm -hmm. when you're ready, um, I can kind of tell you about, you know, I'm 56, so okay. you know this film came out 50 years ago, and I can, when we get to it, I can kind of tell you a story about what this kind of meant, this particular picture sort of meant to me when I was a teenager. Oh yeah, no, go for it. Talk about. I'd love for you to talk about that now, kind of moving into our movie today. That'd be fantastic. Okay, sure. Yeah. Well, um, one of the reasons that you know that Her that Harold and Maude is so important to me is, again, I had been seeing all these studio systems films, just major Hollywood films. And the first time I saw Harold and Maude, I just thought, I didn't know a movie could do this kind of stuff. It's, <laughs> it's just too strange. It's too weird. And, and interestingly, when this film came out in 71, it was both a critical and a commercial flop. It was right. a total bomb. <laughs> and it was really over time that it started to get traction. So this film didn't break even at the box office. 1971 picture, it didn't break even at the box office until 1983. And in the late That's 70s right. and the 80s, it became, you know, we always use this term cult classic, right? Well, you know, I would have been eight years old when this film came out, too young to see it. But by the time I was a teenager, this 
film along with stuff like Rocky Horror Picture Show. <laughs> yes. You know, these were the midnight movies when we were teenagers, right? So you'd go out and, and do your teenage carousing and then you'd go to a movie at midnight. And for years and years and years, um, you could find Harold and Maude screening somewhere at midnight. Really? My, oh, yeah, cool. I didn't teenage know that. Years. Oh, yeah, nice. It's, it's such a cool reception history on this film because it was just it was too weird for audiences in 1971. <laughs> the comedy is too dark. I mean, it, it just, it was too strange for people, but it was that strangeness that was so delicious to us. And especially the fact that, you know, this is a film that satirizes all kinds of forms of adult power, right? Whether it's the military or mm. psychology or wealth or, you know, whatever. And, you know, when you're a teenager, the idea that you see this, this film that's basically doing a really good job of laughing at forms of authority that you're in the process of trying to rebel against. It, I mean, that's where the cult and cult classic came from. I mean, it is a beautifully shot and edited and scored film. I mean, it's really, I think, an amazing piece of work. But part of my connection to it, to come the long way around on your question about whether I watched films when I was younger, is that you know, this film always meant so much to me because it was kind of an adolescent anthem. I think most of us can think of some song from our teenage years that, you know, encapsulated that adolescent mm. rebellion. And in cinema, you know, for me, it was this picture. It was just this idea that, um, in fact, I screened this film the other day with one of my daughters who's 15. I would have been about 16 when I saw it the first time. Oh, very cool. It was really fun, right? And I <laughs> asked her, she really liked the film. And I said, what, what did you like about it? And she paused and she said, I think what I like best about it is that it shows how um, people who are different can still find a place in the world and that the real freedom is when you quit caring what people think about you. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was cool because it kind of made me reflect on my teenage years and say, yeah, there's something about these characters They've both managed, Harold and Maude, they've both managed to move themselves into a space where they're not willing to be judged by the dominant culture, whether it's their family or whatever. And, and there's some kind of, you know, adolescent liberation in that that has never really grown old for me. Every time I screen the film, as I have many times in the intervening years, I still have that feeling of kind of freedom, like, you know, these structures that are always trying to kind of control us uh, we don't have to agree to be judged by them. Yeah, absolutely. This is this is one of my favorite films like I discovered in high school. I would have been maybe a little bit older than you. My senior year teacher in high school for I was in a creative writing class. His name was Tom Macheri. He taught at Reno High School and he taught a creative writing class. And part of the class was watching older films. And mo like I was a film person even then. But this movie, I don't think I'd ever even heard of. And I'm like, Harold and Mon, what is this? It's like an old woman and a young guy. Like, what is this? <laughs> and he played it for us. And I was just enchanted from minute one. And I've just, I've always thought of this movie as really one of my favorites of, of at least the early 70s. It is weird, but it's so like lovably weird. It's very yeah. whimsical. It's, a, it's the kind of movie that obviously it has had a lot of influence on a lot of directors later on. Uh, I think about like a Wes Anderson, some of these directors like clearly have been influenced by the work of Hal Ashby in this movie. Yeah. And it's well, just, so what, yeah. what did you what did you like about the film when you first screened it? Because I'm always interested in that first encounter, but especially when you when you meet a film when you're young and it still means something to you mm -hmm. later. So what what spoke to you about the film at that time in your life? Yeah, well, what spoke to me? So I grew up watching a lot of big action movie blockbusters, studio comedies, like the late 90s, early 2000s. There was a certain kind of movie that we would be fed week to week, right? So watching a movie like Harold and Maude, it just opened my eyes to what a movie could be. It does, didn't have to follow a s strict plot. You know, there didn't need to be 20 minutes in, we need the conflict. And watching right. it again this week, I'm like, it really is just about these characters. We have moments of heightened stakes, like at the end, but it really is just about character and behavior and allowing them to be who they are. And it's not something you see in a whole lot of movies. It's just really, it's a this beautiful rarity that we don't yeah, see very much. That is a great observation about this film. And also, you know, that's one of the things I love about Robert Altman films too mm -hmm. is, 
they depend so heavily on episodic plot. So, for example, <laughs> in Harold and Maud, if I said, you know, where in the movie do they dig up the tree and go to plant it in the forest? Or where in the movie does he have his second computer date? It doesn't really matter, right? <laughs> like, those pieces can be, the incidents right. of the film can be moved around. Mm -hmm. And the action feels really secondary. The, the, the trajectory, to the degree there is one at all, is just Harold's process of self-discovery as Maud becomes a kind of mentor to mm -hmm. him. So you're right that it's, it's really built around that character development, and the action is pretty much incidental. And, and that's really different from a lot of Hollywood films that are just so plot-driven. Yeah, but you're right. It's not just like episodic, this happens, this happens. There, it, there are arcs of this film. I think the arc of Harold is really interesting. At, when we meet him at the beginning, he is just like gone. Like he's like, there's very little happening here, right? There, he's kind yeah. of checked out. And as the, as the relationship with, with Maude develops, I feel like he does grow into a little bit more of the person that he can be when he shares that story, that beautiful monologue about his mother where he just starts crying. Like we see the person inside that is kind of just a blank <laughs> human being in the first 10, 50 minutes. I do like that there is that development and it's not just here's some funny episodes with Harold being wacky. <laughs> you know, like there is a nice yeah. arc to him. Yeah, I agree. And notice too, I mean, this is just one of the things I love about Hal Ashby's films is he doesn't depend very much on dialogue. He's such a good visual storyteller. Mm -hmm. So you think about Harold, I mean, like a lot of teenagers who don't feel like they fit in, I guess his character is more like 20 in the film, but like mm -hmm. a lot of young people who feel like they don't fit in, he doesn't have much to say, especially in the first <laughs> half of the film. Yeah. And when he does, he's very inarticulate, he's very blank. And a lot of filmmakers are really scared of that. Like, mm -hmm. I need my characters talking so my audience won't miss what the point is here. And instead, he, you know, he trusts the visual storytelling and he really lets Harold be that awkward, you know, introverted, maladjusted kid who doesn't really know what to say. And, and that's part of what's very cool about this. And to see the way Harold kind of blossoms and opens up as he starts to appreciate Maude's worldview. I mean, that is a that is a really important trajectory, but it's just not an action driven trajectory. Right. Yeah, we, I, I wrote in my notes at one point, we get kind of an action scene when she's like spinning the car around. Right. I'm like, this is this movie's action scene. <laughs> exactly. Because there's very little of that. But yeah, I just think there's very little in this movie for me that doesn't work. Like I think another great power to this movie is the casting of the two leads. I think watching this, I'm like, the casting of those two was perfectly done. And yeah. I'm like, if this movie had been made, made 10 years before, or 10 years later, they might have gone with more like stars. You know, it could have been an older Betty Davis with, it could have been like right. people that we recognize too much. And I don't think it would have worked as well. Like Ruth Gordon had just won an Academy Award for Rosemary's Baby about two, three years before. So audiences were kind of aware of her, but Bud Court was very new. He had just done a, speaking of Robert Altman, he had just done a film with him called Brewster McLeod. I believe right. that was his debut uh, just a few months before this came out. So he was very new on the scene. There might have been, you know, if this had been even just a few years before or later, there might have been a desire on somebody's part. So no, 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 cast like someone older who's more well known to the audience. I'm glad that didn't happen. <laughs> you know? Yeah, no, I agree. And especially in a film that's not an ensemble cast where mm -hmm. it depends so heavily on a couple of central characters. You know, in the current Hollywood model, the only way to make a film like that bankable is to have those two characters be stars. Yeah. And, you know, you're right. Ruth Gordon was a known quantity, especially from the stage. Uh, but but Bud Court, you know, like you say, <laughs> he had he had a couple of non speaking parts and then he had that that role in Altman, which is mm -hmm. where, you know, where Hal Ashby found him. But I think it's a it's a brilliant casting decision. He, he's just so credible. <laughs> He's just so credible <laughs> as this, you know, introverted, maladjusted kid, you know, and there's no stardom that gets in the way. To me, he is a kind of, maybe it's because I teach college, right? I mean, he's he's basically the age of people I work with all yeah. day, every day for the last 30 <laughs> years. And he's recognizable to me as a kind of everyman character, like stuck in that difficult moment of adolescence where you know, you don't fit in with your parents' world anymore. Right. But you haven't identified your world yet. And, and you know, I think of Maude as kind of like a spirit guide, right? She comes and 
sort of leads him out of one world and, and into some possible future, which, you know, remains ill-defined, but still feels pretty great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what else do we like about this? I think like, for example, I think the humor of this movie, I mean, it's a very specific kind of humor, but I feel like the older I get, I don't know why, the more I laugh at the movie, like I laugh at its humor. The, like, when, like when I was in high school, I wasn't paying as much attention to like composition and things, but that shot of his mother getting in the water and the camera slowly panning down to reveal Harold face down as if he has drowned is one of the funniest shots I think that's ever been done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's, it, that's a total, I mean, that, that shot is such a great example of what I love about Hal Ashby from yeah. a technical point of view. Because first of all, it's a beautiful shot, the, the composition, the color, right. it's also an extremely long take. The shot mm -hmm. that you're talking about is a single shot, there's no cut, yep. so it's very fluid, um, and yet <laughs> it, it is hilarious, right? But, <laughs> but I think when you're younger and you see this, I mean, the, the, the fake suicides are so gruesome, yeah. right? That, mm -hmm. But I, I'm like you, the older I get, the more I laugh. <laughs> there's just, there's something about that juxtaposition of of you know existential fear <laughs> mm -hmm. with humor that i think we see violence and comedy put together so much more now in the cohen's or tarantino or whatever but mm -hmm. i think back then it was really a disturbing idea right i mean if i were to summarize the plot of this film for somebody and say <laughs> oh you know it's about a 20 year old dude who picks up a chick and marries her only she's 80 and he meets her because they both like to go hang out at other people's funerals <laughs> right? I mean, it's so implausible and creepy, but also it's just inherently funny. I, I think of it as a kind of absurdist film, right? It sort of looks at the world, realizes how crazy it is, and then kind of embraces that in a way that, you know, and that was, by the way, one reason that Hal Ashby had a hard time making money with films like this was his sense of humor was just too dark for your average moviegoer, but it sure ages well, I think. Yeah, you talk about his fake suicides. One thing I noticed at the beginning, I'm like, gosh, that shot of him in the bathtub with all the blood, that must have really been shocking to audiences in December 71. Like, am I supposed to laugh at this? Like, what's going on? I mean, we open, I mean, the opening shot with the with the opening titles is going over his slow walk to hang himself, fake, you know, as in a fake way. And then just a few minutes later, we get him like throat slit in the bathtub. It's very strange. It must have been like people must not have known what to really do with this when it first yeah, opened. For sure. For sure. <laughs> and you know what I was thinking this time, Brian, when I rescreened it was I was, you know, I, I always feel this way about books and films I love is that I have a weird jealousy of people who still have an opportunity to experience these things for the first time. Like <laughs> if somebody said, how much would you pay to see Harold and Maude for the first time? <laughs> like I would love to, but as I was screening it, I thought, dang, you know, that opening hanging suicide yeah. scene, if you don't know anything about this movie, it's very realistic and it's uh -huh. very terrifying. And on rescreenings, you're already laughing. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. and if somebody walked into the room, right, and saw you laughing and then looked over your shoulder at what was happening in that film, they would want to lock you up. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> and Ashby just has that ability to take this stuff that is so dark and make it so funny. And, you know, I do a lot of humor writing and I teach humor writing workshops. Mm -hmm. so I'm really interested in how humor works. And I think one of the things that humor does for us is it sort of helps us look at things that are hard to look at. <laughs> Um, take things that are painful or stressful or traumatic and you know if you can laugh at something you can probably endure it you can probably survive it somehow and I think I think that there's a lot of that in Ashby's personality people who knew him the two words that come up most often were funny and cynical I think that's mm. an interesting pairing and you can yeah. really kind of see that in this picture yeah this was his second film he had made a film called The Landlord the year before with Bo Bridges I don't know if you've seen that that was like his debut Right. And then the writer of this, Colin Higgins, he wanted to direct the movie. Yeah. Like he had written it. He had written the script. It's a weird, I don't know if you saw the, like he was like the pool boy to a producer yeah. and he like yeah. slipped the script over. Like, could you yeah. read this? It, and they loved it. it. Yeah. It's such a, it's such a great LA story, man. <laughs> I, I just, this kid, Colin Higgins yeah. wrote this screenplay as his MA thesis. Yeah. Speaking of your MA thesis. At, at, at UCLA. At, yeah. At UCLA. Right. And then, 
I just love this idea. Like, how do you get ahead in LA? Right? <laughs> well, first of all, become a pool boy yeah. and then show your manuscript to the lady you work for. I yeah. hope she's married to a Hollywood producer and that that guy will hire Hal Ashby. And then, you know, I have to say, this does happen a lot that studios will discover properties and usually for a very small amount of money in the case of something like, you know, this kid is a grad student somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. Give him an amount of money that he thinks would be amazing and just make him go away. And, and Hal Ashby was such a, a collaborator, you know, he, because he had come up as an editor and he just had a much more collaborative working style. And to his credit, you know, um, he directed the film, but he kept Colin Higgins on and he mm -hmm. gave him lots of credit and it helped to, you know, potentially launch a career. So I, I thought that was neat. Not only this unlikely L.A. story of, you know, if you want to go to L.A. and make it big as a screenwriter, you know, become, <laughs> become a pool boy. A pool boy. <laughs> uh, but also that Hal Ashby gave credit where it was due to him because it is it, it's really a brilliant idea. Mm hmm. And I'm just curious, like, so producer Edward Lewis, like, got the script. I, I, I'm curious from a producer standpoint to read this and go, oh, yeah, we have to make this movie. Like, it seems like the kind of, I, you know, I don't know what this read like on the script level, but, like, opening with the suicide and, like, I, I just can't imagine a producer reading this being, oh, yeah, we got to buy this. We got to make this. Yeah, <laughs> like, you, you it you seems like it'd good, be hard to get it through. <laughs> yeah, you make a good point. I wonder about that, too. Um, I've never seen the original screenplay, and I mm -hmm. wonder, you know, how much of this kind of dark violence was a Hal Ashby audition. Maybe Hal Ashby, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that would be really interesting to see. It could be that that original screenplay focused, you know, more on the, lo the unlikely love story but maybe right. a little less on, you know, there's a lot of brutal kind of social criticism in this film too. You know, the way it sends up the military and the way mm -hmm. it parodies um, the priesthood, the way it parodies professional psychology. I mean, all of these authority figures in the culture are basically all made fun of. And I think that was another reason, you know, beyond the suicides that, that some people were really offended by it. If you look at, you know, the, the military figure, the religious figure and the, the psychologists, mm -hmm. you know, they're all just completely um, made to look like fools, authoritarian, condescending, yeah. out of touch, misinformed fools, which is kind of the message of art in the early 70s, whether mm -hmm. it was music or film or literature. Yeah. Like, what are you doing with your life? Get get it together. <laughs> that There's a great montage of the of the three of them talking directly at the camera. <laughs> yeah. I can't remember what the third one says, but I was like on the floor. Like it was so funny. <laughs> yeah, those tableau shots are so funny. And and there's there's those are shots that that you know Wes Anderson couldn't be Wes Anderson without yeah. Hal Ashby. Yeah. And you rem you might remember that um the the military figure has framed on the wall behind him Richard Nixon. Right. The priest has framed on the wall behind him the Pope. <laughs> and the psychologist has framed on the wall behind him Sigmund Freud. Right. <laughs> and it's just, it's just, it's such a funny indictment of, you know, all of these authority figures, including his mother, who want to all tell him what he should do with his life. And, and Ashby does such a good job of kind of giving us that story from the adolescent point of view, mm -hmm. which is, and we all felt this way to some degree as teenagers, which is like, these people don't get it at all. You know, they don't get me at all. I'm not interested in the value system they represent. And, um, you know, Ashby doesn't miss an opportunity to make fun of that. And in that sense, you know, th those are the parts of the film that do feel more period bound to me is mm. that specific social critique. Yeah, absolutely. And something else that Ashby does, he's a great director of actors. He's also just a really great director of like the composition, the cinematography. I mean, many, many years before Airplane and The Naked Gun, we have at least one, maybe two of shots where we have characters talking in the foreground and then out in the background you have like really funny humor like that shot where the girl comes over and she's talking to the mom and in the background you see him like lighting himself on fire i'm like this is straight out of like leslie nielsen naked gun yeah. which yeah. would come you know 15 plus years later but it's like yeah. this is the kind of visual humor i i don't feel like we see in too much. I mean, maybe it was in some of those older films with like Laurel and Hardy and and Groucho Marx, the Marx Brothers. But like this period of time, I've been looking at a lot of 71 films the last few months. I haven't seen that kind of visual humor much. And it's really creative, really fun. 
Yeah, I think you're really right about that. And it just goes back to Ashby as a visual storyteller, mm -hmm. you know, in the same way that he doesn't over rely on dialogue. Um, you know, he doesn't over rely on the verbal for his humor. And there's just, I mean, if you screen this whole film with no volume, you would still laugh a lot, <laughs> I think. Um, he, he's just, and because he came up in the industry as an editor before he became a director, which is a really unusual right. path, mm -hmm. um, you know, the most obvious example of, you know, that skill in this film is this incredible montage at the end of the movie. Mm -hmm. You know, that depends entirely on editing. You know, after the moment where they're in the um, ambulance going to the hospital mm -hmm. and Ruth Gordon's character, Maude, says, you know, uh, Harold says, I love you. And she says, that's wonderful. Go love some more. That's the last dialogue line of the film. Mm -hmm. And then there's a bunch of the movie left, but it's this braided parallel editing um, that tells the story without any dialogue at all. And it's so it's so powerful. So you're right. I mean. And I think that naked gun connection is brilliant. I hadn't <laughs> thought of that, but it is true. Just, you know, how can the humor occur behind the character and not necessarily with their, they may not even know, right? So yeah. I agree. But what makes the movie, I think, so special is that it could just be this funny movie, this black humor, but the relationship between Harold and Maude is so sweet and so genuine. It never feels weird. Maybe the shot of them in bed together i don't I, i'd like to talk to you about that more. yeah I <laughs> but that like <laughs> i i actually forgot about that i'm like i'm like do they, i'm trying to remember do they kiss by the end and then we cut to him in bed and i went oh i forgot about that part i don't know how that wasn't ingrained in me from the time i saw it in high school <laughs> but yeah, I, let, I wanted to ask you about the scene where they're in bed together. I was like, does the movie need that moment? Like, does the movie need to get them in bed for it to work? And I wasn't quite sure if I had the answer to that. Yeah, I, I really <laughs> thought about that scene a lot this time through <laughs> because I was screening some of the original theatrical trailers for the film. And in okay. one of them, it shows them kissing, which doesn't really happen in the film. But, mm. you know, that... That shot you're talking about, Maude is asleep, Harold is awake and smiling, <laughs> and Shirtless. they both appear to be naked under the yeah. sheets, right? And if you think about, there's a kind of trajectory in this film, too, that I was really noticing this time, which is Maude opening Harold's eyes to the pleasures of, of the senses, right? She right. wants him to try this particular kind of tea, mm -hmm. then she feeds him a particular kind of cake. And then, you know, they smoke out of the hookah and she dances. She introduces him to music. She is a, a painter and also a model for a painter. So there's all of this kind of sen sensual, mm. sensory mm -hmm. kind of delight that he is getting introduced to. And one way to think about it is, well, what would the ultimate, you know, trajectory be? It would be toward, toward a sexual moment. Right. But I still don't, I'm not convinced that that's the only way to read that. Um, mm. You know, I, I agree that, it shows that that Harold has come to a new sort of comfort level with his body and that that's because of Maude. Mm -hmm. I, I think Ashby wants to leave it so that you can think they've had sex or not as you wish. And mm. it might not matter, but I do. I, I, I was just, I was so shocked <laughs> again when I saw it because I thought, you know, we are just a couple years after the Hays Code. Here's a 20 year old dude and an 80-year-old woman, unmarried, naked under the sheets in a classic morning after shot, right? <laughs> and I just, it's so, it's so brave. I don't know whether the film needs it. Um, maybe some viewers need it. And maybe other viewers <laughs> are shocked by it. And I think, I think Ashby would just be just fine with that. Because, you know, he, he wants to take a relationship that 99% of people would condemn right out of the gate. A 20 year old and an 80 year old that's just wrong and convince you otherwise i mean by mm -hmm. the end of this film if you're not rooting for them as a couple you're heartless and yet right if somebody just asked you hey do you think it's okay for 80 year olds and 20 year olds to hook up you know you'd probably raise an eyebrow but at the end of this movie <laughs> it, it feels it feels right you know it feels right the mo yeah it's so interesting the movie does make you root for the these two even though on another level in life you're like that yeah, no, 20 and 80, no. 
Exactly. Yeah. Because <laughs> this is something, you know, when you look at actors, you know, the 55 year old actor, the male, and he's, he just married his 23 year old girlfriend, you know, you kind of do this. And right. so it is, it, it's always kind of a part of our conscious of when it comes to real couples. But in this movie, Ashby does his job and these actors do their jobs. They make you really care about them. And it's not to say we're rooting for them to kiss or to make love or something. We, we want them, we, we know that they are so spiritually linked from their first scene together. And this movie does have a meet cute in a way, like many romantic comedies do. And yeah. here it's just at a funeral, <laughs> you know, yeah. which and is it, un unusual. It, it's interesting to think about, you know, what kind of genre, you know, right. what genre identification, you know, is this a dark comedy? Yeah. Is it a mm -hmm. social satire? Yeah. But, you know, as soon as you use the word, the term romantic comedy, you just get the no. willies a little bit because of this unusual age gap. But if you look at the conventions of the romantic comedy, many of them are present here. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I've come to finally just say <laughs> to myself that my hesitation about thinking of it as a rom-com is my problem. You know, that that's mm. that's me being uncomfortable with their ages, because if this film were exactly the same and these characters didn't have that age gap and, and I asked you, is it a romantic comedy? I think you'd have to say yes, right? Yeah, if they if, if there wasn't the age difference, if it was a movie where they meet it, you know, they go to these funerals and they fall in love and they were just a few years apart. Yeah, I think you're right. I think we would be more in line to call it a romantic comedy. Yeah, and I also really like the gender inversion where you gave the great example of, you know, Hollywood always, especially in the classical period, having male leads paired with female leads who are who are a love interest but young enough to be their daughter yeah <laughs> but you don't see the opposite right? right so the idea that that it's the man who's young and inexperienced and the woman who's older and wiser mm -hmm. um, i think that dynamic is really interesting too yeah if this movie if the genders were flipped i don't know if we would be talking about it 50 years later yeah you know that's a that's <laughs> a know? really interesting point point. and then you know i wanted to ask you too you know speaking of little moments that won't get out of your mind and that there's that that moment that you're speaking of but also you know there's that um shot and and ashby gives you a little zoom to make sure you're really paying attention it's only lasts a few seconds where you see the numerals that are tattooed into her forearm and you know the implication is that she has been in a in a concentration camp right and there's, mm -hmm. there's nothing else in the whole film to support this there's no other comment there's no allusion there's no nothing in the maison scene there's there's nothing but there cannot be any other reason why she has these numbers tattooed into her arm mm -hmm. unless she's been in a death camp and so now if you want to like go back and read the whole film through that one shot that lasts only a couple seconds you know how does she learn to embrace life in the way mm -hmm. she has well, you know, we can presume that she's been through this this experience. Right. Um, so I, I think, you know, that's an, an example, too, of Ashby using small things in a really deliberate way, not overplaying it. You know, if you don't notice that or you don't care about that, the film still works. Mm -hmm. But if you notice it and you want to think about it, it gives you a really interesting lens through which to examine, you know, Maud's character and how she came to be the way she is. Why, how does she have this kind of lust for life, willingness to be spontaneous, a willingness to live in the present, things that most of us have trouble doing, right? Well, part of it is, if we read it through that moment, is just, uh, you know, having having had that brush with death, presumably seen people that she loves uh, killed, you know, it, it has given her a different kind of philosophy. And she doesn't refer to that experience when she's with Harold, but I've got to believe that that's part of the subtext of the film. Yeah, and I think a lesser writer, a lesser director would set aside a scene in the third act where she would talk about her history and why she is the way she is and and Harold would nod and listen to her and that would make for a lesser movie. Sometimes it's best to put it on the audience, let them come to their you know, final decision about what happened to her, exactly. Absolutely, and you know, Brian, you mentioning that reminds me of one of my favorite things about Hal Ashby's filmmaking. And you know, you see this not just in this film, but also in other pictures of his, including being there, which I love. But, you know, the typical move at an emotionally intense moment between two characters is to go in for the close-ups. So you get that real intimacy in people's facial expressions. Mm -hmm. And Hal Ashby does this thing that 
the industry hates and that I love, which is in a key emotional moment, he'll drop to a long shot so that you see two characters having an encounter, but you can't hear what they're saying. <laughs> you can't see the looks on their faces. And it's incredibly powerful and moving because he uses it strategically as a storytelling device. By that stage in a film, you're so invested in the characters, but it really invites you to participate in you know, imagining, well, what, what's happening right now? What is that encounter all about? You'd mm -hmm. think it would be purely frustrating, but it's actually quite beautiful because it leaves so much room for your imagination. It's not, I just, so many films just talk their subjects to death, the dialogue <laughs> just, you know, like, all right, we get it, you know? And uh, <laughs> when Ashby drops to long shots in those emotional moments, it's such a, it's such a strange feeling. You really feel like, you're looking on from a distance, you know something really powerful is happening, but you have to participate in imagining what it might be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. There's so much, I mean, I'm just like thinking of other things I love. In the, I love Vivian Pickles as his mother mm -hmm. is very funny in this. Like, I don't yeah. know if I've seen her in anything else, yeah. but her, the way she <laughs> treats his suicide, his fake suicides of just yeah. like, so blankly just like nothing it's just that's very funny and her like okay you have one more chance and bringing over one more woman <laughs> like, yeah. yeah and and you know talk about a great you know humorous line at a bleak time is after he has that third and and talk about prescient computer dating in 1971 yeah, right he, <laughs> yeah. he saw the future but the third date after she reenacts the scene from romeo and juliet and is appears to be dead on the floor <laughs> And the mother walks in, and instead of like, you murdered this woman, she says, Harold, that was your last date. <laughs> That's, <it. laughs> That's just, I, that character could have been played like too over the top, too caricature. Yeah. Like, she plays it at just the right level. I don't know how much of that is Ashby's direction, what that actress brought into it, but it's just perfect. Like, it just makes those scenes really pop. I really love her work in this. And, and it's a great it's yeah. a great example too, Brian, of how humor isn't just a respite from the theme or the story. It really carries it because mm -hmm. the central dynamic there, right, is that Harold doesn't feel heard or understood by his family. Right. Well, okay, that's a theme we've seen in a million movies. Um, but those scenes illustrate the degree to which she doesn't know him or understand him. She doesn't try to understand him. She doesn't listen to him. Um, and and yet Ashby manages to make that really hilarious. So work is being done in characterizing what his struggle is at the same time that, that the humor is, is there. So, you know, in, in Ashby films, he doesn't really alternate between the serious and the funny. He manages to keep them working together so often. I really love that about his movies. Yeah. And one other thing that works really well, too, is the opening the movie with the fake suicide the way that the fake suicides get more and more grand as the movie goes on, even though it's more it's more about character over plot and there's not really much plot, we do see throughout the movie these different fake suicides and it all goes to the, the, the big finale of the car going off the cliff, which is the okay. biggest spectacle of all of the fake suicides. So that trajectory too is an interesting kind of side, kind of part of the film that you might not really think about when you when you come away from the movie thinking about the relationship and but that kind of visually seeing those get bigger and bigger and then after Maud is gone we take the car over the cliff I just think that works really well too yeah that's a that is a great observation that you know he is trying to get his mother's attention and when he can't get it he just keeps raising the stakes right he keeps escalating it yeah. <laughs> and then and then you have this other really strange tension that I've been thinking about for a long time and I haven't figured out how I feel about it. And that is, I, I can't remember how many fake suicides there are, I think six or seven. But anyway, so mm -hmm. throughout the film, Harold is faking suicide, faking suicide over and over again. But the film ends with an actual suicide, right? But it's not him, but Maude. Right, think, that's a good point. Know, that's, mm -hmm. that's a really important thing to remember is that, you know, there's this weird sense in which she she gives up her life and he he gains his i mean she dies and he's somehow reborn there's something there but but there's also that weirdness of the paralleling that he's faking suicides and then she actually performs it and what, is, exactly what does right. that tension really mean i'm still thinking about that yeah i put that in my notes i was like does she need to commit suicide 
can she fall asleep and not wake up? Is it, does it have to be that she takes, she takes pills at the end, right? Right, right. And she's like, okay, I've got a few hours left. And he just starts like breaking down in front of her. He can't believe this and yeah. call 911. He doesn't right. just like, okay, you know, step out yeah. of the room. He has committed to her at this point, right? He yeah. loves her. Yeah, I mean, so it's he's really already, heartbreaking. Yeah, he's already told his mom that he's going to marry her, right? And the mom thinks it's a joke when she <laughs> and he gives her the face. picture. <laughs> but you know, yeah. the, when you think about the the ravages of aging and disease, and how many people who live really full lives go into a part of their life in the end that is just very challenging and mm-hmm. very difficult and very painful physically and emotionally, very sad. I'm not endorsing suicide, but I think in the context of the film, what it really means is, you know, Maud is a person, unlike all the rest of us, who Mm -hmm. has really figured out how to live life entirely on her own terms. And she's made up her mind that 80, 80 is the right age. Right. And so it's, it, it, unlike most of us, again, with disease or dying, it is completely under her control. She makes a decision about it. And she does it, and nobody else has anything to say about it. And I'm not saying that makes it heroic. I still find, I still find her choice really troubling, even mm-hmm. even within the context of the film. But it is consistent, at least, with Ashby trying to develop her character as a person who wants to live life in her own way, with no regard for what mm-hmm. anybody else might think, and completely under yeah. her own control. And that's true earlier in the film when she's just stealing cars. She doesn't, she's just like <laughs> driving over sidewalks, and like no care in the right. world. Right. You know, the cop pulls her over. The cop, did you notice, played by Tom Skerritt. <laughs> yeah, I did notice that. I was like, I know that actor. I've seen him and I, stuff. He's familiar <laughs> from a million things. <laughs> yeah. But like, I mean, the what she does with the cop and plays all those games with him, I'm like, I mean, you are asking for it, Maude. Like this is, yeah. this is pretty dangerous territory here. And that's part of the fantasy of the film, right? Is, you know, you think of the cars she steals, the way she drives, you know, all kinds of things <laughs> that she does. You know, if any of us did that, we would be in jail. So <laughs> part of the fantasy of the film is like, you really can live your life any way you want to and get away with it. And that's not how real life is, but that's part of why the film works is that there's some part of all of us that would like to believe that If we really did seize the day and live completely the way we wanted to, with no regard for other people's judgment, that it would be a blossoming, that it would be a beautiful thing, rather than that we would get fired and end up in jail and be dumped by our spouses and whatever, right? (laughs) You know, but I also think part of part of what Ashby realizes about the comedy is it is true that older women can get away with a lot of stuff, right? Mm, and, yep. you know, in the culture, right? Like, and, and it's partly that she's underestimated, right? She's an old lady. She's not going to steal a car and, you know, burn rubber and take off. So <laughs> that, it makes it even that more delightful because we have this idea that older people are locked in their ways and they're going to behave the same way and all this. And she's the opposite of all of that. Yeah. I just think, I mean, this movie, the cast is so great there's really is there anything in this movie that any scenes or moments that you're just you you think don't work that if you could if if ashby could go back and change one or two things or anything that you would change about this movie i mean i i do think there's an awful lot of uh there's an awful lot of uh cars being driven erratically (laughs) and i understand that that establishes mod's character but i think for me the scene with the cop is a little too long Okay. Uh, mm-hmm. Just because there are multiple encounters and multiple. Yeah, there's, there's two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess, you know, to maybe I would fine tune it that way. But I, I really think, again, you're seeing the hand of a professional editor here. And one of the things that makes movies that could be great only sort of good a lot of times is that they're really baggy and they're mm-hmm. really loose. And you know that if somebody had the self-discipline to go in and pull pieces out, they could tighten that up and really make it a great story. You know, Ashby was such an experienced editor before he ever directed his first film. And I really think you see that all over this film. There, there is so little in the picture um, mm-hmm. that you feel like, oh, that's, that's just unnecessary. And, <laughs> yeah. and that's part of what makes it artistically so beautiful is just that tightness. 
Yeah, it's a very tight 90 minute film. I talk about it on the podcast all the time. There's so many films from 70 and 71 that go a half hour too long that or two hours plus that I feel like could be shorter. We just yep. talked about Fiddler on the Roof a few weeks ago. Mm-hmm. And that is a fine film, but it's three hours long and it's just yep. very long. It's like, could we yep. just tighten it down? And this movie, I feel like of all of the films I've looked at for 71, watching it again, I'm like, it's just a, it's the perfect length. I don't know if this movie would have the staying power it does if it was a full two hours. I don't know if it needs it, you know? Yeah, I I agree with you. And also it's because it is, you know, it's a film that has trajectory and development, but it doesn't have a conventional action driven plot, as we said. And when you don't, you know, have your five big action sequences (laughs) to hang your film on, when you're really just talking about interactions between two characters, um, I think it would be really easy for the. I mean, it's amazing to me when you think of, if you summarize the plot of this film, it would take you about five seconds. There's just not that much there. <laughs> and then also you look at Hal Ashby's average shot length way longer than almost any director in the period. So long shots, or excuse me, long takes. Mm-hmm. In other words, the pacing is very slow. And I love slow movies, but but most people don't. And, you know, he manages to make this not only a film in which very little happens in terms of conventional plot, Mm -hmm. but also a film with a really slow um, editing pace. Mm -hmm. But part of the reason he can get away with it is it isn't two and a half hours long. (laughs) Exactly. There's that shot of them at that cemetery and he zooms out 45 seconds, a minute. It just keeps going. (laughs) He's not in a rush to get anywhere in this movie, right? And that's what I kind of love about it. I love, as long as you're not taking me on, as you say, a two and a half hour journey, that could be 90 minutes. That's where I'm like, I, I check out a little bit. <laughs> yeah, and that shot, Brian, is a great example because that pullback from them in the cemetery where you then start to see all of those white gravestones all of the and gravestone. more, and more and more and more and more and more until you're back so far that it almost looks like an impressionist painting. Yeah, And it's all about the image, but also, right, you know, again, Hal Ashby's visual storytelling, that is such a beautiful, such a dramatic shot but it also supports the theme of the film, which is like, guess who's going to die? Everybody. Mm-hmm. You too. All of these people, every one of those little white dots you see by the time that it becomes mm-hmm. a long shot, that's somebody who had choices to make about how to live their life, and they can't make those choices anymore. Mm-hmm. So what are you going to do? Yeah. You know, I, I just think it's very powerful. Yeah, well said. Uh, let's see, anything else? Do you like the music by Cat Stevens? Does that add an element to the movie? That you enjoy? I do, I, I do, but part of that may just be nostalgia because when <laughs> I was much younger, I really liked Cat Stevens. I do think that Ashby in post-production has done a really good job editing the score with the visuals. You'll notice a lot of times the lyrics of the song when it comes into the film seem to match the sort of theme of the moment really mm-hmm. closely. You know, I didn't know until recently that originally they had Elton John lined up to do all the music for this film early in his career and when he couldn't do it for some other commitment he was the one who suggested cat stevens but i think it gives it a really nice period feel yeah i kind of it's kind of like simon and garfunkel in in the, in the graduate. graduate there is an yeah. element of that i've seen that on a few other films what was the other one there was one with liza minnelli at the end of the 60s a sterile cuckoo had like like kind of one artist you would hear throughout the movie it was something that we'd seen a few times before but I, I feel like if this had been just a bunch of random pop songs from 71 or something, I don't think it would have the same power. I like that it's one artist and it's almost like another character in the movie from beginning to end. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. it you know, and again, in a film that doesn't have a conventional plot, how do you provide continuity that makes mm-hmm. it feel like the whole thing hangs together? And, um, you know, I think, I think that music is part of it. Another part of it, by the way, is this film was all shot in um, the Bay of San Francisco Bay Area, mm-hmm. and um, Ashby was insistent that they not shoot when it was sunny. So you'll notice that through most of the film, you get that kind of Bay Area fog, mm-hmm. you get a lot of overcast, you get rain at the funerals, Maud has her bright umbrella, you get all that stuff. And then the only time you really get sun is in that last montage at the end of the film, you'll remember that, you know, first Harold is in his car and the windshield wipers are going, it's raining. And then a little bit later, it's foggy. A little bit later, it's just a little dark. And then at the very end, it's sunny. So he's 
he's cut that together so that even in that montage, Trace is a kind of journey for Harold from, you know, from darkness to light, sort of mm. following Maud's example. Yeah, exactly. God, there's that shot towards the end where it's like magic hour and they're just seated yes. next to each other and he, they're kind of holding each other. Like they're, yeah. they're really at this great place. And yeah. he sh shoots it from the back and you see the sun going down. And it's just like, Isn't there's some really beautiful? stunning, stunning shots in this movie. Yeah. A movie that yeah. if you haven't watched it in many years, you might not remember that it does have some really astonishing cinematography, some beautiful shots throughout. I really agree. Yeah. So anything else you wanted to say about the movie? I mean, I had some notes here about, as you say, it wasn't a commercial hit, wasn't a critical. I mean, the great Roger Ebert gave this movie one and a half stars out of four, yeah. which is just mind blowing but, to me. This guy gave four stars to so many movies in 71, so yeah. many bad movies. <laughs> he gave four stars to Cold Turkey with Dick Van Dyke. I don't know if you've seen this movie. It's really rough. But Harold and Maude gets one and a half out of four. Okay, Roger. Yeah. I, you know, I think it was just too weird. It yeah. was just too weird for people. And, you know, I, I don't know if this is true, Brian, but I think I read somewhere that many, many years later, probably decades later, that Ebert basically apologized. Oh, did he? <laughs> yeah, he basically just said, hey, I just want to come out publicly and say I was wrong. Um, and, and I love the fact that this film is such a slow burn because that's really true with a lot of innovative art, whether it's music or visual art or film or literature or whatever, right? A lot of things that, you know, I mean, whatever. I, I don't think James Joyce probably sold a lot of copies of Ulysses or Melville sold a lot of copies of Moby Dick, right? These things just, you know, they were ahead of their time. And you look at the cinema of somebody like Wes Anderson, who's immensely popular, and mm -hmm. it's so difficult to imagine his visual style existing without Hal Ashby. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. P.T. Anderson a bit too, and films yes. like P Punch Drunk Love, I was thinking yep. about a little bit while watching Harold and Maude. There's some yep. Punch Drunk Love <laughs> I noticed too. Yeah, so yeah, a, a lot of our great directors have, have, have definitely modeled at least some of their films, if not all, on the work of Ashby for sure. Yeah, and you had asked me to think also about, you know, what other films that are more contemporary right mm -hmm. we might pair with um, yeah with Harold and Maude what and, would you pair what's a modern film that you well, might now, pair I with I think you had said about 20 years or so and this is a little bit older but I that's think fine Wes, Wes Anderson's Rushmore that's is a great really choice because you there you have another example of something that's dark and funny and another example of a young man who's in love with an older woman and how does that get negotiated right but, but you know so much of Wes Anderson's work has to do with, you know, how do we think about love relationships between people who we wouldn't normally think of as being sort of socially acceptable in that way. Another example is Wes Anderson's film Moonrise Kingdom. Mm -hmm. Now, there's no age difference between the two characters, but um, but Sam and Susie, you know, they're very, very young, and yet they are capable of loving each other in a way that's so much more sincere and well adjusted than any of the adults in the film, but it really pushes your idea of like, well, it looks like love, but can it be love if you're only 13? Can that really be love? <laughs> and so, you know, those those occurred to me. And then also one of my very favorite films in the whole world is uh, Sofia Coppola's film Lost in Translation. That's now, my choice. Is <laughs> another example, right, where you have a younger person and an older person. Mm -hmm who are each sort of going through things that are specific to that mm -hmm. stage of life and yet connecting with each other in a really mm -hmm. deep way. So yeah. I, I think that any of these films that are character driven analyses of, you know, what does love mean mm -hmm. when it doesn't, when the people who are engaged in it don't look like what we think should be socially sanctioned. Yeah. An 80 year old woman and a 20 year old, uh, man, that just, we, we don't have a way of thinking about that in our culture. And yet, mm -hmm. you know, if you ask me, do they love each other? Do Harold and Maude love each other? I would say yes. I would say they're in mm -hmm. love. Now, you know, did they have sex? Should they get married? I mean, there's lots of complications, but I think that the film kind of asks you to open your mind about, you know, why do we say that only certain people can be in love with certain other people, whether that's their gender, their age, their sexual preference, whatever. Um, these films kind of, I think, open our heart to the idea that just because love doesn't look like what we expected it mm -hmm. to look like doesn't mean that it isn't real. Yeah. And speaking of Lost in Translation, that was my choice. And what I 
what I think works really well in that movie is that they don't consummate the relationship in Lost in Translation. I think that's the right choice for that movie. If there was a scene in Lost in Translation of them in bed, I think the movie would not have worked as well as it does. I like that it's just about the friendship and the bond that they have over these very, very few select days together. And I just think it's Bill Murray's best work on film. I just think he is so great in that. He's funny, but we see a side of him. I mean, Wes Anderson, of course, has brought out other sides to Bill Murray and his work too, like in Rushmore. But there's something about his performance in Lost in Translation I just find so effective. And he's just so, he's so hurt at the end that he has to leave this young woman. But yeah. the smile on his face after they share that moment and he gets back in the, back in the cab yeah. or the limo yeah. or whatever it is, it's so moving. I just love the ending of that too. Well, and notice too, right? That is right out of Hal Ashby's playbook that mm -hmm. arguably the most important moment in the whole film is when we get that long shot of them in the street and he whispers something in her ear. We don't know what it is. And we don't know what it is. <laughs> and, you know, I, th just for fun, I always, you know, when I teach that film, which I do often, mm -hmm. you know, I'll put as extra credit on an, on an exam or an assignment what does he say to her? And of course, there's no, there's no answer. We don't know, but I'm always mm -hmm. interested in what my students think he yeah. says to her. And so that's an absolute Hal Ashby move is like when the chips are all down <laughs> and we don't know what's going to happen with their relationship and he gets out of that cab and runs back to her and are they going to be together forever and what, you know, what's going to happen? And then bam, you've got that long shot and you have to figure it out for yourself. All mm -hmm. you know is he gets back in the cab looking satisfied that he's done the right thing. Mm -hmm. And then it's up to you to figure it out. And I agree with you about the restraint. In fact, the only, the only shot in Lost in Translation where they're in bed together is that beautiful overhead shot. Right. Where they, they are in talk. a bed together. <laughs> yeah, but they just talk, mm -hmm. right? And we know that he has sex with the lounge singer and that it means nothing to him. Yeah. But it's because she means so much to him that they don't have sex. So I, mm -hmm. I agree that that's the right choice. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a great movie. It'd be really interesting at some point. I would even do it to watch Harold and Maude and Lost in Translation back to back. That would be a really wonderful evening. <laughs> like, yeah. It's yeah. just two they, great they, movies. It's such an interesting pair. And one thing it would do for you is it's not just, you know, the, the ages of the protagonists, mm -hmm. but, but it would show you um, so obviously how much of Wes Anderson's work is derived from Hal Ashby. You, <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm serious. You, you yeah. just see the quirkiness. Mm hmm the dark humor, the character development, the long takes, the reliance on long shots. I mean, there's just a lot in, in Ashby's technique that really made possible the work of people like, like Wes Anderson, whose, whose work I love. I, I think you're right. Yeah. I think Lost in Translation is a great choice. Yeah. And if, if I can ask one more question about the movie, about Harold and Maude, I ask this of each guest, like if they were to make this movie in 2021, how would it be similar how would it be different? I don't know. Could you make Harold and Maude today? I don't even know if you could. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, in, in an age of content warnings on everything, I just don't know, you know, about a series of, you know, hey, I want you to really, really laugh with me at suicide. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, yeah. I think you could still if you did it carefully and make fun of the military and make fun of the priesthood, I, mm -hmm. I think the suicide sequences would be very hard to pull off. Right. I, you know, I, I don't, I don't know. And I suspect if the film were made today, the unlikely love relationship between the two characters would turn on something other than their ages. I mm -hmm. don't know what, mm -hmm. but some other way in which, society says these two kind of people shouldn't be together mm -hmm. and then the film would insist that with love they can right it's the oldest story we know how to tell um but i don't know that's a that's a fun question <laughs> i will think about that and get back to you yeah I, I feel like the sweetness might be lost a little bit i feel like there is a cynical edge to so many movies now i feel like it'd be hard for someone to pull that off unless they were just such a fan and they got two dynamite actors. I mean, I think it maybe it would just be it would be tough. It would be tough, I think, to pull off so much of what Ashby did then today. I just don't know. So we've talked about a lot of films that I think could translate very well to a modern adaptation. This one, I feel like, should stay where it is. <laughs> That's yeah, my, I, my choice. I think it would be hard to do. And and one of the things that is really hard in storytelling as a writer, I struggle with this a lot. <clears throat> when I wanted to pick something sweet 
how do I do it so that it doesn't seem superficial or right. cliched or sentimental? Mm-hmm. And I think as a humor writer, now I'm going to give you my take on Ashby. I think it's because he uses humor and uses dark humor mm-hmm. that he then buys himself moments where he can be that sweet without the whole film feeling saccharine. And That's so right I think point. that some of those really touching moments with Harold and Maude, you just can't do that for 90 minutes, right? You, you have, <laughs> there has to be some contrast. That has to happen mm-hmm. in a magical space or moment in the film. Well, what's around that? How do you create that magical space so that when you get to that sweetness, it doesn't just feel superficial? Mm-hmm. And I think it's because you have all this really shocking... Uh, dark humor um, that that then creates the opportunity to have a sweet moment that feels so real, that feels so believable. Yeah. So yeah, that takes us to our final segment on Hal Ashby. This will be, you know, we will we will get to his work some more in the coming years. But I really would love to just end by talking about Ashby. You've brought him up a lot, and just how you admire his work. Like, what are your like two or three favorite Hal Ashby movies besides Harold and Maude? And you know, maybe just a few more words about, you know, what does he do so well as a storyteller, as a director? I think partly he depends so much on the visual. Mm-hmm. I think partly he is so able to combine social criticism with um, really meaningful emotional content. Because there are a lot of films from this period where you can see the social critique clearly, but you don't necessarily get those human stories in as mm-hmm. powerful a way. And, you know, you had mentioned Lost in Translation as Bill Murray's best work. You know, I love films that involve comedians as protagonists that aren't funny. I think Bill, you know, for some reason, like, you know, Robin Williams has some dramatic roles that Mm -hmm. I think are just so touching and beautiful. Peter Sellers as the lead in Hal Ashby's film Being There. Mm -hmm. You know, he he was doing Pink Panther movies. He was a slapstick Mm -hmm. comedian. And suddenly, you know, you put him in this role where, yeah, it's funny, but it's not that kind of funny, right? It's, right. it's very different. I, I love being there. It's my absolute favorite movie in the world. Um, wow. So <laughs> with Harold and Maude, I would say always being there. I like Coming Home is a Hal Ashby film mm-hmm. uh, that that does what a lot of other films would go on to do, which was think about the trauma of vets returning from wars, in this mm-hmm. case from the Vietnam War. Um, I like Bound for Glory. It's not a great movie, but I'm a big Woody Guthrie fan, and mm. that's basically a film adaptation of a biography of Woody Guthrie. Uh, Shampoo is still held in very high regard, but for me, Harold and Maude and being there, you know, mm. that's really the best of Ashby's cinema. And and he has an interesting trajectory too, in the sense that he made all these films in the '70s that people like you and I still admire and screen. And in the 80s, he basically continued making the kinds of movies he had made in the 70s, and he just bombed and bombed and bombed and bombed. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, he made about 13 films, but roughly half were in the 70s, half were in the 80s. And those films in the 70s, really, he was the right guy in the right place at the right time. Mm-hmm. And in the 80s, this stuff has really flops, both critically and commercially. So we are talking about a filmmaker who, you know, unlike some of these other people, like you know, Coppola and Scorsese, you know, Ashby yeah. had a particular moment. And I think that may be one of the reasons why when people rattle off those three or four or five names of people who are really important as new Hollywood directors, mm-hmm. they don't always mention Ashby, even though if you ask these other directors, they would all tell you that in the 70s, Ashby was one of the most important American directors, hands down. Yeah, it's so interesting when you look at his titles from the 80s. We really don't know much about those films. They just kind of crash and burned. But his run from, I would say, Harold and Maude to being there is one of the most astonishing runs of a director in a in a single decade that we've ever had. <laughs> like, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah, I agree. It's just, it, it is remarkable what he did in those years. And for you, you know, because your podcast focuses on the 70s, you know, you'll be talking about a lot of films, I'm sure, that will somehow move around an orbit that was being mm-hmm. created in some ways by this this guy who was such an innovative yeah. filmmaker and who barely gets talked about anymore. Yeah. And as same with you, my favorite of his outside of maybe Harold and Maude would be Being There, which is a just a beautiful film. As you say, Peter Sellers, he really was doing sequel after sequel after sequel of Pink Panther 
And then he does being there. He gets an Academy Award nomination. It's right at the end of his career. I believe he passed away the year, the next year in 1980. Yeah. And it's just a wonderful kind of closing film to his long and amazing career. One film he didn't mention that I love is The Last Detail with Jack Nicholson from 73, yeah. which is which is a pretty wild movie. Uh, also Randy Quaid and really great cast. And I haven't seen it in a long time. I did like a Jack Nicholson binge maybe 10 years ago. I'd never seen The Last Detail. And it's one of like his, I mean, we when we think of Nicholson, we think of kind of the crazy performer. And there are films that we've watched with him like uh, Five Easy Pieces where he's much calmer. He has his moments <laughs> in that movie. But Last Detail, we see you know, a little bit more of the Jack Nicholson that we've come to know and think about is, you know, when we look over his long career. But I, yeah, I wanted to mention the last detail too is an interesting Hal Ashby film. Yeah, I haven't seen that one in forever, but I, I think among film scholars, that's probably, that, that's got to be the one or two most important films to, to people who actually study film. Mm -hmm. They really admire that particular picture, even though I think that, you know, a movie like Shampoo or Coming Home are probably more widely known, but right. um, among film geeks, the last detail is is a film people really admire. So it's an amazing run he had, you know, starting with Harold and Maude in 1971. Michael, this has been such a joy to talk to you today about this incredible film. I've been looking forward to this episode all year, and this, you know, exceeded my expectations. This was so much fun to talk to you about Harold and Maude today. Oh, thank you for having me, Brian. It's so good to see you again. And it's always fun to get together with friends and talk about movies we love. Yeah. So do you have anything you'd like to promote or anything you'd like to any, anywhere we can find you online? For those of you watching, I have two of Michael's books with me here. Michael is an author of Rants from the Hill, Raising Wild. Uh, anything else you'd like to promote? Yeah, I'd like to mention my new book is coming out on March 1st from Pegasus Books, and it's called On the Trail of the Jackalope. And, Very cool. Um, you can think of it as the complete natural and cultural history of horned rabbits, and it, it <laughs> is much more, uh, much funnier, much more interesting than you would imagine. So I spent years interviewing people and traveling around the country and trying to get the story behind the story behind the story of how these uh, horned rabbits came to be iconic in American popular culture, and also that there are actual horned rabbits in nature. Their their growths on their heads are ca caused by a virus, and so I study the medical history of how the actual scientific study of real horned rabbits helped result in the safest, most effective anti-cancer therapy that we've ever devised, which is the HPV vaccine. So it's kind of mm. You know, Jackalope from A to Z, and it comes out again March 1st on the trail of the Jackalope. So look for that one. Awesome. We will. All right. So thanks, Michael, for being here. Thanks Great. to all of you for listening. You can find us online at filmat50.com. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And until next time, remember, 50 never looked this good. <laughs>